Let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I would encourage you, if you aren't a Bible marker, to maybe tonight think about it. And if you are a Bible marker, to mark with me. This is going to be a semester-long eschatology course. Uh, when I used to teach at the Master Seminary, I taught uh, eschatology and pneumatology and soteriology and harmartiology and uh, you know, all the other ologies, uh, ologias, which are studies of things. But one of the, the interesting ones to teach was heskatas, the final things, the study of the final things. And what's amazing is that though this morning we talked about hundreds and thousands and all those numbers, there are seven clear events that, that aren't kind of like uh, oblique out there and kind of unclear, but they're specifically clearly stated. And each one of them has a kind of a, a very basic introductory portion of the scriptures that is kind of the key passage for those areas. And that's what I'm going to show you, actually seven paragraphs of the Bible tonight. And from those, to show you these clear steps the clear events that take place sequentially between now, today, and when, as the verse we're memorizing says, when everything's melted and gone and we've started over again with the new heavens and new earth. So from night, right now until eternity, there are seven clear steps. And that's what this What's Next series is all about. Because God left us the greatest book ever written. He watched over every word so that this book is exactly all and everything and explicitly what he wants us to know. This book is our guide, it's our plan for how we're to live every day of our lives until he comes or until he calls. Now the Lord called two of our dear saints just two weeks ago and they got a personal rapture. For the rest of the church, First Thessalonians 4 tells us, that the next step is the rapture. So if you're a Bible marker, somewhere on that page, you could write one uh, or step one or however you think. But I'm going to do these sequentially in chronological order. And if you remember this morning, I talked to you about the, the 2,040 verses, all those 215 events. All of those events that are left on God's prophetic calendar fit into one of these seven little categories that I'm going to show you tonight. So it, it will cover everything. With each of these uh, steps, there's an affirmation that God wants us to make for him. And I hope that as we're studying this, that we'll go beyond just eschatology and pro Bible prophecy, and we'll actually make it a personal worship experience. And, and let me show you what I mean. Starting in verse 13, and you can follow along, and I'll read. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, so he's talking to believers, concerning those who have fallen asleep. So since Paul had gone in First Thessalonians, or I mean in Acts 17, remember he in Acts 17 went from Philippi to Thessalonica, and then he ministered there for maybe three Sabbath days plus. We don't know if he stayed much longer after that, but he, we know he was there three weekends because it says so. And then he stayed a little longer, then he moves on. But in that short time, he introduced the gospel, people were saved, and now he is writing back to them. And since he left, people have died. And, and he says, oh, you're wondering about everything I promised you about Christ's return. Those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He's trying to tell them what happens uh, when people die. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this I say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. We won't go ahead of those who are asleep, those who have died asleep and and uh, it's hard not to say this because in just a few weeks there's a whole group of us actually going to the city, Thessalonica, and we're actually going to sit in the cemetery of the first century. And I'm going to share with you a little later uh, about how powerful this sermon Paul preached to these people became in their lives. And he tells them that those who come to Christ sleep in Jesus. Do you know what they did? They began calling the burial place of the believers no longer a necropolis, necros death, polis city. Up until 
the Apostle Paul and the revelation of the New Testament and the scriptures that God breathed out of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Before that, everybody was buried in a necropolis, a necropolis, a city of dead people. But when they learned about this truth, remember Jesus said, don't, don't worry that our friend sleeps and, and he awakened the damsel. See, he started comparing death not to a horrible, uh, you know, on the other side of this dark river sticks where this, you know, Hades and all this stuff, which was in Greek mythology. No, he said, those who believe never die. They, their bodies sleep. So how did that affect the, the world? Christians began to bury their dead no longer in the necropoli. They buried them in a separate area, and they called it a cemetery. Did you know just that word? Uh, you go anywhere in our country and you see cemetery. That's a result of Christianity, because the word to sleep in Greek is koimeo. Koimeo, a place of sleeping, is what a cemetery is. It's where bodies are sleeping, waiting what we're reading about here. For the Lord himself, verse 16, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And by the way, we're, that word will rise in your Bible, do you know what that word is in Greek, literally? Stand up. So you know what's going to happen? Uh, and I think about this every time. I was just parked, I don't remember... Um, Oh, I think it was at Word of Life last weekend, but somehow I was parked, waiting, and there was a cemetery right over there. You know, I had to wait because I was riding in their van, and I was just looking out there. And what I thought about, because I was working on this, I thought, at this instant, when the last trump and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ, they'll stand up. They just, their bodies just stand right up. I mean, it's going to be an amazing... I don't think that the world will get to see it, because First Corinthians 15 tells us that it happens in a in a twinkling of an eye, which is a millisecond. But they're going to stand up first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. So their bodies stand up and they're changed in an instant. Their spirits, which were already with the Lord, are rejoined to the body and they actually get to go up. So what's interesting is that, that they're coming uh, with the Lord. He's coming with his saints, but he allows them to join with their body. This is all very instantaneous and fast, and, and you're not going to have to worry about getting in the right place at the right time, like at a graduation ceremony or something or a wedding. God's going to do all the details. But they are going to be united with their bodies, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And this is supposed to do something for us. Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Okay, that's the rapture. Now, that, by the way, that word never occurs in the Bible. So don't fight with someone over the rapture. They say, I don't believe in the rapture, it's unbiblical. They say, well, the word's not in the Bible. Actually, rapturos is a Latin word, and it comes from when St. Jerome, uh, the Bible um, translator, he translated Jerome lived in Bethlehem in the 3rd century and early 4th century A.D., and he took the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts and translated them into the language of the Roman Empire, Latin. That became what's called the Vulgate, if you've ever heard of the Vulgate. And a lot of things that, that we have titles for come from the Latin terms. And the Latin term for when he translated, and the dead in Christ, uh, I mean, verse 17, will be caught up. That word caught up in Latin is rapturos. You ever seen someone enraptured? They're caught up with something, you know, uh, maybe a song or something. They just... That's the picture he got in Latin for this catching up. Actually, the Greek word is a little different. It's the word harpazo, which means to be snatched, to be grabbed, to be pulled out. Kind of like uh, if you lean over and your checkbook falls down in your fireplace and the fire's going, you go, ah! Oh! You get it like that. That is the word harpazo, that you harpoon your hand in there and pull it out before, or, you know, if something falls in the water or whatever, you grab it because you don't want anything to happen to it. That's exactly this word. And this is where the whole concept of the rapture comes from. We're going to spend an entire... Um, uh, message of this series talking about the rapture so I'm not going to defend it I mean there are probably um, 25 incredible comparisons between the second coming and rapture which shows in, in every sense possible these are two separate events 
But we'll do that a different time. But how should we apply this uh, this way? Be ready. That's the, the, the reason we know about the rapture, the reason the Apostle Paul told them about this. He says, I want you to be ready. What do I mean by that? Back up to chapter 3, verse 13. He says in the same book, 1 Thessalonians 3, look at 3.13. 3, uh, 3, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, every chapter ends in this book with a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Every chapter ends with something about the second coming. Why is he telling us that? Because the rapture is for us to think about. Be ready. Christ is coming for me. He's not coming for your family. He's not coming for this church. He's coming for individuals who know him and love him. Who are born again. Who are in his kingdom. Remember one of the most stirring things about this truth is that when I understood the gospel, when I as a young man came to know Jesus Christ, I used to watch those, those times after storms where the clouds would break open and the, the rays of the sun would come down. And I thought that is exactly in my mind what it's going to look like at Christ's return. And I used to earnestly say, Lord, I want to not be ashamed before you at your coming. Be ready. Christ is coming for me. So what's the lesson of the rapture? If you've marked it in your Bibles in 1 Thessalonians, if you're marking and you wrote rapture and, and this passage, don't forget what the rapture is for. The rapture is a reminder that we are supposed to be ready. Remember Jesus said, Blessed are those servants who when their master comes, he finds them ready. The emphasis of Christ's kingdom parables, of his, his closing ministry parables, especially Matthew 25, are about readiness. And, and the servants that weren't ready, he says that there was something greatly wrong with them. So you and I should think about one thing when we think about the rapture, not arguing about it. In fact, someone came up to me after the morning service and they said, isn't this rapture thing something that came around just in the 1850s? I said, well... Um, actually, Paul wrote this in about 50 A.D. So it came about 1,800 years before 1850. But see, the people who don't believe in the rapture, they say that this was just fabricated by the Plymouth Brethren in the 1850s, kind of as an escapist mentality, so that Christians would not want to be working and, and changing this world, but they would be kind of waiting for this exit. Well, that's, that's a valid criticism. In every criticism, there's some truth. And Christians do kind of get a fortress. They kind of hide and they kind of stay away without doing what we were left to do. But that's not why the rapture was given to us. It was given by the Apostle Paul to encourage the saints. That's what verse 18 says of chapter 4. To comfort one another and to tell them, be ready. Christ is coming for me. Okay, let's practice tonight. Let's say that, that truth, the white words, okay? Say it with me. Be ready. Christ is coming for me. That's what communion's about tonight. When you prepare your heart for communion, and when I prepare my heart, I say, Lord, I want you to cleanse me. I want to look at my life and examine myself. And I want to see if I'm ready this moment for you. Because you're coming for me. Am I all ready to go right now? And if not, maybe you ought to check out of this prophecy thing and start thinking about it because we should be ready. Well, the second great event that's coming is uh, the Bema. So back up to 2 Corinthians uh, in your Bibles. And if you've never marked this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is our next stop, the second chronological event. Immediately following the rapture of Christ's church is this event for us. 2 Corinthians 5, and I'm going to read the first 10 verses. And you'll see where some of these famous truths come from. They're all right here. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. So we're supposed to have a temporal view of how life is. In fact, Peter, in Second Peter, he compared his life to dwelling in a tent. And he compared his death to rolling up the tent and leaving on a journey. And he says, as long as I'm here before my exodus, before I, I shove off, before I break camp, he says, I want to keep stirring you up. Because life, life is a tent. 
And earthly life is temporary, like living in a tent. So we know if our earthly house, this body, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God. Now, if you think that this body is real, you ought to see how real the one you're going to get is. Do you notice the comparison? This body is like a tent. If you ever lived in a tent, I mean, those tents are just, I mean, a fraction of an inch thick. The, the material that tents are made of, they're just very, very thin and unsubstantial. But he says what we're getting is a house. And it's a house not made with hands. And it's not temporal, it's what? Eternal. And it's not on earth where it's going to be defiled, it's in the heavens. You see, there's so much truth in this first verse. For in this we groan. And by the way, the older you get in the Lord, the more you groan. Groan for what? Earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found Unclothed. That's what this naked thing is. He says, I don't want to be without my, my permanent, eternal habitation. I want that which God has prepared for me. Verse 4, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Everything here is mortal, temporal. Easily destroyed, easily ruined, everything. But he says, I want to be swallowed up by life, which is eternal. Verse 5, for he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a, and this is a beautiful word, as a down payment, as an engagement ring. This promise of God, the Holy Spirit is our down payment. Of all we're going to get. And I'll tell you what, if, the, if, if you think the Holy Spirit is amazing living within us, just think, he's just the down payment. He's the engagement ring, as it were, the promise of all that God is going to give us. So he says, he is the, the guarantee from God, verse 6. So we're always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There's where that little phrase comes from. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no soul sleep. We don't sleep somewhere in this, uh, what the, the Roman church has invented called limbo. You've heard of limbo. Uh, that's another Latin term that comes from the Roman church, which limbus patrum, limbus infantum. It's this limbo kind of soul sleep place. Um, the Advent Christian Church and a lot of other churches have, have perpetuated this idea that, that when you die, you go into limbo. You go into soul sleep. No, the Bible says no soul sleep. As soon as you're absent from this body, as soon as the life is torn from this body, be it by cancer or some respiratory illness or some sudden uh, car wreck or plane crash or, or some debilitating disease, the instant that, that our, our spirit, our immortal soul, is torn from this body, from inhabiting it, we're present with the Lord. Now watch. Verse 9. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. Why? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether good or bad. That word seat, judgment seat, is the word bema. Bema. So that's the second event that's coming. First, the rapture. The second event... This Bema tells us we ought to be holy because Christ is going to test my life. Not your wife's life, not your husband's life, not your parents' life, not your children's life. He's going to test my life. Look, look back at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body. Did you know you can run, but you can't hide from God? God is going to have a day of reckoning. Whether or not you have used your redeemed body for what pleases Him. That's why, look at verse 9. We make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. He says, my earnest longing and desire is that my life more and more and more line up with what is pleasing to God. Remember when Jim Berg was here way back and did his conference, his little saying, which is so hard to forget, it's so, so clear, only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. Paul said the same thing. And he says, I'm looking forward to the judgment seat of Christ. I want to be able to answer that I have as much as is humanly possible, as much as, as I appropriated God's grace, I lived a holy life to please Him. 
You know, it makes it reduces life down to a lot of simple decisions. Is doing that going to please God or just me? Now, it's okay if it pleases both of us. It's not okay if it doesn't please the, the larger one in the equation, which is the Lord. But we were born wanting to only please ourselves. That's how we were born. We want to go our own way. We, we, remember the, the child, uh, as soon as they're old enough to do stuff, everything goes to their mouth. That's, that's that, that image of everything's for me. And everything they pick up just right in that mouth. And, and that's just a, a vivid picture of, of our selfishness. Everything we think about, we first think about, how does it please me? And God says, when you're born from above, there's a decreasing frequency of us wanting to please me. And an increasing frequency of me saying, is that going to please you? Not my friends, not my peers, you, God. And so that's why the, the second response, the second prophetic event is the Bema. And I should say I want to be holy. That should be my response. Be ready for Christ's return. But as soon as he returns, I'm going to get to stand in front of him and answer for my whole life. I want to be Holy. What does holy mean? I used to think it meant you had to have a wrinkled face, kind of gray hair, and your hair pulled back like this, like the, the ladies. I think some of them tightened their hair too tight and it made their faces like that when I was growing up. You know, it was the people that came on Sunday night. Nobody young came on Sunday night. My parents made me come, but I couldn't find anybody young. It was never fun on Sunday night. It was just the old people with their hair pulled back like that, you know, that always came. And so I thought, they always talked about the holy saints, and I thought it was all the... Once. You know what? It, it isn't that. You know what holy means? It doesn't mean old, and it doesn't mean no fun, and it doesn't mean, you know, that, that you, you're against everything. It means that you are set apart. Holiness literally means set apart. I want more and more of my life set apart. Set apart for God to please Him in all that I do. And that's what we should want to do. So the second application is, be holy, Christ will test my life. Okay, let's say that. Be holy, Christ will test my life. Now, if there's anything that you don't want him to test, then you should tonight change that and say, Lord... I don't want that part of my life to burn up. I want to redeem that time. I'm wasting time in this area. I, I have an inordinate amount of time spent here. I have an inordinate amount of my resources invested in something that really isn't going to matter. I want to change that. See, communion is when we commune. We're on a date with him. He asks us out to dinner. And he says, I gave my life for thee. What are you giving for me? You understand? Be holy. Christ will test my life. Okay, third event. Let's go to Revelation 6. And this is a tribulation. This is just standard fare. But I want you to think about the application of this because this is where it gets really interesting. Revelation 6, 1 through 17. And, and uh, this is just a horrific litany of, uh, of awful things are going to happen. I saw the Lamb. Uh, when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures. Remember, we met those a while back. They're always flying around the throne of God. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. Some people thought this was Christ. And if it's Christ, he's riding in bad company. Because, I mean, look at the other horses. So it's not Christ. It's uh, probably the Antichrist uh, or a picture of false peace. But uh, a white horse and he that sat on it had a bow and a crown was given him to to him and he went out conquering and to conquer and then come these seals in verses 3 and 4 uh, this, this whole uh, fiery horse and a fourth you notice it says uh, uh, there was given to him a great sword and he takes peace and people kill one another uh, in verse 5 he opened the third seal and there was a black horse and the pair of scales and this is the whole famine thing remember it's, it's talking about um, the the Famine and starvation is going to be in the Great Tribulation. Verse 7 is the fourth seal, and it says, When the fourth seal was opened, the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him, and power was given over them for a fourth of the earth to kill with sword. That's with warfare. With hunger, that's the famine thing we saw in the previous seal. With death, 
And that could be resulting from the war and everything else. And then, by the beasts of the earth. And when we get to this section, we'll spend a whole time, one whole um, service, looking at the tribulation. When we look at this and compare, this is going to be what, what verse 7 of, of Matthew 24 talked about. This is the pestilence time. The beasts of the earth, I don't believe, are going to be killer whales and, you know, um, you know, Kodiak grizzly bears. It's probably going to be the minute beasts of the earth. In fact, if you're a news watcher, the headlines at, when I got all done typing this and running it off at 5.50, I just looked at Drudge for one millisecond. You know what the top headline was? It says, this avian flu is becoming an epidemic. It, and I'm going to talk about this, but for the first time in history, a woman caught flu directly from an infected bird over in China. First time there was a transmission. It's never happened before. They've never documented a direct transmission that way. And the woman gave it to her mother. And both of them died within 12 hours, horribly. From this avian flu, this is bird-borne flu, and uh, amazing, isn't it? Interesting that Drudge would put that up just as a sermon illustration for me, talking about the beasts of the earth. But actually, we're living in a time when what they're saying is, if this avian flu, if this deadly flu, they're comparing it to the Spanish flu of 1918. Do you know how bad the Spanish flu was? Fifty million people died of it. Fifty million people died in one year of the flu, and there weren't as many people as there are now. The only spot on planet Earth, I mean, people died of this up in Alaska, and people died in Siberia. They died everywhere. There's only one spot that was recorded that they didn't die, and that's in an island that's out in the delta of the Amazon River. And it's the only spot we know that no one died of the Spanish flu, and they think that it was a combination of them being totally isolated and the flow of water around that island. So if you want to escape, go there, okay? Uh, if you want to escape the beasts of the earth. Well, this, this whole, we could go all the way through reading about the fifth seal from verses 9 through 11, and then the cosmic disturbances that are in verses 12 through 17. And verse 13 says, The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Did you know that last year the whole world, the astronomical community, was holding their breath because... An asteroid came closer than any known object has ever come to the Earth. And I mean, they actually, President Bush, it was revealed, was getting ready to do a deep impact speech. If you ever watched that movie, you know, about the asteroid hitting or the comet, or I don't know what it was. I don't watch them well enough to remember. But the president got on and said, you know, this is going to happen. Bush was that close to saying, this thing's going to hit somewhere on Earth. Now, it was only small. It was only the size of three football fields. But wherever it hit, it would have hit with the power of 50 hydrogen bombs in one place. If it hit the ocean, there would have been tsunamis on both coasts of whichever ocean it hit. If it would have hit a landmass, it would have vaporized wherever it hit. In 2001, we came so close to an object like that. Well, we're not going to miss in the future because when we get through this, there's actually going to be either an asteroid or comet hit the Earth, and it's going to poison the waters, it's going to cause great cataclysmic devastation, it's going to cause the, the moon to look like blood because of all the dust it throws up, and the water's going to be polluted. All that's going to happen to this Earth. Okay, so what? What do we know about that for? Be thankful. Christ will keep me from that hour. How do I know that? How do I know that? Because Jesus said it twice. He said it to the letter in, in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. He says that you will be kept from the hour of testing that will come upon all the earth. And he said in 1 Thessalonians 5 that he has not appointed us to go through the wrath of God, which is what God describes the tribulation as. So the reason that I'm pre-tribulational is not because some Plymouth Brethren guy, Mr. Edward Irving, thought of this back in the 18-whatevers. I think that Paul presented what God has always planned. Just for you to think about, twice in the scripture we see clear pictures of this. In the flood, there were three groups. There was Noah in the ark, which protected him through the flood. There was the world outside the ark, which got destroyed. And there was Enoch, who left the planet before the flood hit. Noah pictures the Jewish people who are kept secure through the tribulation. The people killed in the flood pictures the people in the tribulation who aren't going to be able to escape. Enoch getting pulled out before the flood pictures 
God's plan for the church. It's interesting that Enoch is the earliest prophet and he talks about Christ's return in the book of Jude. Second picture, you ever remember the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story? Well, they were not the only known Christians in Babylon. Who else was there? Daniel. How come he didn't get in trouble? Well, if you think about it, the same three groups are there. The soldiers that threw them into Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were killed by the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were kept through the fire. Daniel was most likely, the only thing that Bible commentators can figure out is, he was sent by the king on some official business before this statue event, so he left town before the fiery furnace which is another interesting picture of the three different groups of one leaving before the, the bad time, some being kept through it, the Jewish people, and those that get destroyed by it, which are the unbelievers. So what should this be thankful? Christ will keep me from that hour. When we study the rapture and the tribulation, we'll look at why the scriptures clearly teach that we will not be here to experience the wrath of hundreds of millions of horrific demonic creatures the size of horses who have stings that, that cause you to, to be in mortal pain wishing you could die and God will not allow you to die. Do you think God would do that to believers? Make them not be able to sleep at night because these, these demon creatures can come right through walls and attack them. I mean, it's going to be, that's why people are going to be dying of fear during the tribulation. We should be thankful. Christ will keep me from that hour. Let's say that one together. Be thankful. Christ will keep me from that hour. The next event is going to be Christ's second coming. Look at uh, Revelation 19. If you're marking your Bible somewhere, maybe at the top of that page, uh, you can note this one. Because this is event number four of the uh, seven steps from here to eternity. And this is what... Uh, the scriptures tell us, starting in verse 1, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation, glory, and honor, and power belong to the Lord and our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And again they said, Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders, which we've seen in the past, representative of our priestly ministry of worshiping God. And, uh, and it could possibly also be a picture of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles and, and all of us together there worshiping. But whatever it's a picture of, the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God. It's attached to worship and it's representative worship. And so uh, we will be there. I plan to be there and I plan to be saying the four hallelujahs that are listed here, and I hope you do too. And they worship God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, the sound of mighty thunderings. Remember I told you how majestic this is. Saying, Hallelujah, there's a fourth one. For the Lord our God reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready, and to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now that's one to think about. What you're going to be wearing in heaven is a culmination of your righteous acts on earth. That's an interesting thought. Ponder that one. I mean, that, that means how you live does matter. And salvation is not just fire insurance, as some people think. It's also the privilege to live. And, and so those that do sacrifice, it will make a difference. Those who do live a holy life, they will forever be grateful. Interesting thought, but that's not what we're on tonight. Keep going. Verse 9, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And then I fell at his feet and worshipped him and said, see that you do that. Uh, John is, is being referenced here. I'm your fellow servant, the angel said, of your brethren. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. And then that marks the event which we call 
the second coming of Christ. We're at this marriage supper. We're arrayed finally with what we really were. He, he at the judgment seat presents us with what we were in his sight, our righteous acts. And that's, what, that's why some are going to shine like the stars forever and some are not. Uh, there is going to be different degrees of, of your glory in heaven, dependent, reflecting what you were on earth, so it does matter. But then, verse 11, heaven is open. And here's the, the second coming, and this is us coming with him. This is why the second coming cannot be confused with the rapture. We're already clothed in our white garments. We're already gone through the time of testing, and now we are riding with Christ coming. And the heavens were open, and a white horse, and he who sat in him was called faithful and true and righteousness. He judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Verse 13, his robe is dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God, and the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, and white and clean, followed him. And out of his mouth came the sword, and he treads the winepress. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's what Enoch saw in the book of Jude. And he said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands times ten thousand of his saints, myriads of his saints. So the second coming is Christ coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords, riding at the front of this massive grouping of his saints and the hosts of heaven. And I always tell people, if you don't make it to the Holy Land while you're on earth, that's okay. You're going to get to go with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be the guide. And that's where he's coming. He's coming to Armageddon. He's coming to the great climax of human history. And that takes place. And we'll study that for a whole evening. Be patient. Christ will right all wrongs. You notice what it says here? That, that out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, verse 15. He'll strike the nations. He'll rule. He's going to make all the wrongs righted. You know, a lot of people spend their life trying to get even. Someone hurt them. A boss, a neighbor, a relative. And they just live in this bitterness to get even. You know what Christ does? He liberates us from that desire to get vengeance. Why? Because we should be patient. He's going to right all wrongs. He's going to make everybody stand and answer for every sin. Every unbeliever is going to have to answer for every sin. And he's going to show them that they were wrong and what they did wrong and how they offended God and how they harmed others. And he's got all the time in the universe. And every lost person is going to come one at a time. And Christ is going to right all wrongs right then on the spot. So you know what? We don't have to. You don't have to waste your life getting even with people. Waste your life embittered and trying. Because we should be patient. Christ is going to right all wrongs. Yes, there have been horrific uh, murders. There have been horrific, uh, you know, terrible events on the planet where, where groups of people have been like the, the Rwandan massacre and genocide and like the whole Holocaust thing. And just like the, the terrible things that happen, abuse and, and, and wickedness on this planet... Be patient. Don't take vengeance. He's going to right all wrongs at the second coming. So we don't need to worry about that. That's something that you should think about. Be patient. Don't get even. If you don't take recompense, God will. That's what the book of Hebrews says. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will recompense. You want to you wanna really get even with someone? Don't stay mad at them. Give it to the Lord. And say, I commit this to you. The Lord will rebuke them. You don't have to. God can do a much better job than we can. If we stop wasting our energy, being impatient, and before the time, trying to get even, God says, be patient. Christ will right all wrongs. Let's say that one. Be patient. Christ will right all wrongs. There, you've all gotten a lot more energy in your lives because you don't have to get even with anyone. The Lord will take care of it. The next event after this is the millennium. Look at chapter 20, and it's the first ten verses. And, and what is amazing about this is that this is the most contested part of biblical prophecy. In fact, this morning again, I was talking with uh, different ones after the service, and, and someone says, I'm all mixed up. You know, I, you know the, these people I listen to on the radio, they're ah, millennialists. They are covenant theologians. I said, yes. I said, yes, they are. And they deny the distinction between the church and Israel. And what the broad term for these people is, ah, 
millennialist. There's the word millennium. Again, here, here's, here's a, another uh, Latin word. Th- this is the word for thousand. And what they believe is, ah, means alpha privative, means no, thousand years. Okay, let's see what the Bible presents. Look at verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key, the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Years. And I wonder what that means. Okay? So we keep reading. And uh, verse 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him in and set a seal on him so he could not deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So whatever it's a symbol of, it's a symbol again. But after these things he will release him for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. This is where this morning, remember the global positioning and the cashless society and the beast? This is the beheading reference. It's also in chapter 7 and 14. That the people that don't acquiesce the beast that are tracked down as believers are uh, beheaded. Uh, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for, there it is again, a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the, there it is again, thousand years uh, were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for how long? There it is again. A thousand years. Do you see where the millennium comes from? I mean, if, if there's any part of biblical prophecy that is clear, I mean, either, either John had a stuttering problem or God wanted us to know that there is literally going to be a 1,000 year period when Jesus Christ fulfills so much of the Old Testament. You ever read Psalm 2? It says that, that he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David. That's a Christmas verse. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus came to sit on David's throne. He certainly never sat on it here during his first coming. During his, his humiliation and his sacrifice on behalf of the sins of the world. It's going to be in the future. When he comes as king of kings, he's going to rule this planet for a thousand years. And that's what millennium means. And it goes through uh, when the thousand years have expired, verse 7, Satan will be released from his prison. There's that thousand years thing again. He'll go out and deceive the nations who are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and gather them to battle. The number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone. And look at this. This is a significant verse. Where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night. And if you notice, the beast and false prophet were cast in the lake of fire in chapter 19, verse 20. How long have they been in there? A thousand years. Are they annihilated and burned up? No. Hell is eternal conscious existence in a lake of fire. And it's not annihilation, which is becoming a popular notion in the British Isles, and it's across the Atlantic, and it's here in churches now. A comfortable way to deal with hell is to believe that God just incinerates people. Kind of like your bug zapper on your porch. You know, the bug gets close, it's gone. Over. No pain. It's over. The problem is the Bible doesn't present that because 1920, the beast and the false prophet are cast in this lake of fire. And in chapter 20, in verse 10, that's where the devil's thrown. And it says that's where the beast and false prophet are. They're consciously still suffering there. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, what is the lesson? And we're going to look at the millennium. It's an amazing thing. Be focused. Christ is going to perfect the earth. You know, when we're young, a lot of times we get this visionary uh, uh, kind of want to just change the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we should be redemptive in our lifestyles. We should pick up the trash. And we should make everything look nicer after we're there than, than when we came. But you and I are not going to perfect the earth. 
And we should get focused. Christ said, I'm going to perfect the earth. I'm going to roll back the curse. I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to make there be a perfect planet. There's not going to be poisonous anymore uh, serpents or spiders. And there's not going to be carnivorous animals. The millennium is a fun thing to study. It's, Christ is literally going to be ruling here. And he's going to have the whole world coming through this huge temple that Ezekiel describes for eight chapters in Ezekiel 40 to 48. And he's going to have this interesting method. If you don't come to the church service at the temple, it won't rain in your, your farm. I mean, it literally says that in Isaiah. If they don't come up to the feast at the temple, no rain. How do you like that? I mean, he's going to run with a rod of iron. And also it says you get to live for 100 years. And if you're a rebel after 100 years, you're cut off. It's very lots of interesting stuff going on in the millennium, which we don't have time, but we will that night. Be focused. Christ is going to perfect the earth. I mean, it's okay to be zealous and, and, and have all these ideals when you're young about changing society. But you know what? Be focused. Only Christ can change society one soul at a time. And that's what we should remember. Then, the great white throne, um, you know about that. And I saw the great white throne and him that sat on it, verse 11, from whose face the heaven and the earth fled away. And the dead, small and great, verse 12, were standing before him and the books were open. And the sea, verse 13, gave up the dead. Why is the sea listed separately? It's because of World War II and when they used to bury people at sea. Now I think that there's a whole generation of people living under the sea in the dust. The people of the flood. Hundreds of millions, maybe a billion people that were buried. They keep digging them up, you know. Uh, these squashed skeletons, you know. And they call them primeval man and all that. Those people that are squashed into rock uh, are, are people that were compressed uh, a lot of them probably either were buried before the flood or whatever and compressed by the flood and they, they find these Cro-Magnon men and all that stuff. But there's a lot of them sleeping in the dust, okay, uh, at the bottom of the sea. But look at this. Death and hell were, verse 14, cast in a lake of fire. And verse 15, one of the most sobering verses in the Bible. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in a lake of fire. What should that do to you and me? Probably what it did to Paul. Did you know Paul reflected on this truth? You know what he said? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul was not a casual soul winner. He was a persuader. He knew the terror of the Lord and he tried to tell people about Christ. What should it do for us? Be faithful. I will point people to Christ. Jesus left you on earth for one thing. If he wanted you just to worship him, he would have taken you to heaven. The worship is perfect there. If he wanted you to just serve him, he would take you to heaven because the service is perfect there. If he wanted you to glorify him, he should have taken you to heaven and me to heaven because glorification is perfect there. He left us here for one purpose. Go and be my disciple-making evangelist on this planet. That's why he left us here. To tell every creature about Jesus Christ. You know what the great white throne does for me? It makes me want to be faithful because I want to point people to Christ. When's the last time you tried to point anyone to Jesus Christ? You should think about that at communion. If he left you here to please him by pointing people to Christ, why do we do it so seldom? I talked to a little high school young lady and she said, this morning she said, how can I be a witness? Told about all the problems in her high school and all the ruined lives. And I said, well, you start out by something that I started when I was your age. I said, you, you get a list of people that you're praying for. And you're asking God to open up their, their lives and their heart to get a gospel witness. And then be ready when the Lord does, what will happen is they'll come and sit by you on the bus or they'll, they'll come and sit by you at lunch or they'll walk with you when you're walking somewhere and they'll just, you'll just say, that's unusual. They're seeking me out. And all of a sudden you'll hear them opening their heart. And what you're doing is you're getting an opportunity to share the gospel. I hope when you reflect on the great white throne and whoever's name was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you will reflect on the fact that Jesus Christ left you and me here. Not to get so full of Bible doctrine our heads pop, 
but to go and tell every creature we possibly can about him. Be faithful. I will point people to Christ. That's what he left us for. Let's say that one. Be faithful. I will point people to Christ. Here's the last one. Heaven, I'm not going to read 21 and 22. You can. What's the application? Be investing. I will lay up treasures in heaven. Uh, the only thing that you can take with you is the people that you point to Christ. The only thing you can have over there is what you send ahead. And I hope that you will be investing in heaven. Jesus commanded us in the Sermon on the Mount, don't stack treasures on earth because you're going to lose them. Stack them in heaven. How do we stack them in heaven? As we go through this series, I'll remind you of this. But I told you before, and I'll remind you tonight, you can stack your prayers in heaven because God collects them all, Revelation 5, 8. God says you can stack gifts in heaven. In, in Mark 12, 42, he says, even the least gift I will never forget. He says, I count the souls you lead to me. That's a treasure in heaven, and you'll shine like the stars, it says in Daniel 12, so we should win souls. He says, I remember every time you give a cup of cold water in my name, so we should serve him. And Jesus says, I love you to go for me. He says, anyone who has forsaken uh, mother and father and homes and lands and everything for my sake and the sake of the gospel will receive 10,000 times whatever you give. He says, I love those who go for me. And we should go. You should be thinking in your life, how can I go for the Lord? How can I give more of my life for what will count forever? Not to just get more stuff, but to lay up treasures in heaven. Let's say the last one. Be investing. I will lay up treasures in heaven. I want you to think about that. Bowing your head with me. We're going to have a time of preparation for communion. And these seven points are what we're going to think about as we commune with the Lord. I invite the elders and deacons to prepare the Lord's Supper. And in a couple of minutes, after we have time to just make sure we're ready, we'll partake of the Lord's Supper. Dear Father, tonight, so seldom in our lives that it's totally quiet. But you've told us in those still times that we can know that you are God. As we bow before you tonight, I pray we would be ready because Christ is coming for me, that we would be holy, because you, O Christ, will test my life, that we will be thankful, because you, Christ, will keep me from that hour, and that we would be patient, because you, O Christ, will right all wrongs, and that we would be focused, because you are going to perfect the earth, and we would be faithful pointing people to you and that we would be investing laying up treasures in heaven you've told us every time we celebrate this table it's to remember that you will not partake again until you celebrate this new with us when you get us home to heaven I pray that we would tonight be communing with what you want us to do with the rest of our life I pray we wouldn't waste it, but we would decide tonight to renew our consecration, to renew our holiness, our set-apartedness for you, that we would renew our submission to you, that we would say, I bow before you, I will obey. I love to yield myself anew and afresh to you. Thank you for the bread and thank you for the reminder that your cleansing blood has washed away all of our guilty stains. We have a new beginning tonight. All we are, all we ever will be, all we hope to ever be, we can start over afresh and anew with you tonight. O oh God of new beginnings, may we experience your cleansing. And may we offer ourselves anew and afresh in consecration as we celebrate your body tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we celebrate your body tonight, 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we celebrate your body tonight, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we celebrate your body tonight, in the name of Jesus,